Okay, <clears throat> recording is on. Let's take a moment to pray and we'll get started. Can I please ask somebody to pray with the class? Then we will get started. Go ahead. Anyone? Just pray together. Pastor, can I pray? Go ahead, please. Publicious Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this wonderful week which you have given to us. We give you all the glory, honor, and praises, Father God, for everything. Lord Master, your, your mighty plans for each one of us, oh, Father God. We pray that, Father, fill us with your spirit of wisdom and understanding to receive every word which is going to come out from your servant's mouth. Let these words should not be vain words for us, O oh God, but let these words be life. And let be able to use these words, of oh Father God, in our personal ministry, in our personal life, O oh Father. We pray and we ask you, Father, let Lord Master, let your son receive the word of revelation from the throne room of yours, so that every word which is going to come, let it carry the power. And Father, Father, let it carry the spirit of God. I thank you, Father God. Let it edify us, O oh Father. Let it build us, O oh Father. Let it build our faith. Let it, build, let it be productive for our ministry. And Father God, so that we can able to stand together to build the kingdom. We give you all the glory, honor, and praises in Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC309 Urban Church Planting. So today, um, our the last class we covered all the way to the uh, the sharing the notes here. We talked about urban church planting and missions in Acts. We are now going to get into our next section, which is we're going to talk about practical aspects. Get into the practical side of uh, planting a church or engaging in urban missions. Um, how do you engage the city as you try to bring the gospel and the message of the gospel to them? Right. So we're getting into practical things. I'm going to share just you know the things that we can do. Um, some of these things may be directly applicable in uh, situations that you may find yourself in, but some of these things may need to be tailored or customized to your local situation so uh, please understand that you know not everything i say may can be applied directly uh, some things may need to be customized or tailored to your specific situation but it will give you ideas what need to be done so how do we get started in church planting now your personal preparation as a church planter as somebody's going to pioneer a work I, I i purposely left it to the end uh, because uh, before you kind of, you know, so we will discuss that, having understood what goes into the work, okay, now how do I get ready for that work? So I thought it's best best to talk about it towards the end of the course. So we purposely left it there. So we'll come to it. You know, how, what can we do to prepare ourselves? But let's get to understand, you know, what goes into, what is the work involved? What goes into starting or pioneering a church or any kind of Christian ministry? What goes into it? And here are some things to we can think about and share. So the first thing you know we would talk about is a core team. Uh, sometimes God may use you as an individual, and we have examples of that. For instance, when Philip went to Samaria, you know he may have gone alone. He may have other people may have gone with him. We don't know, but he's the only person mentioned there as preaching in Samaria. So uh, Philip goes and preaches, and he's called from there to go into uh, a desert place called Gaza, where he is given the opportunity to interact with the Ethiopian. From there, he goes on to Caesarea. So as an individual, we see him moving, and God is using this man, Philip, as an individual. Now, Paul, when he begins his ministry, he goes along with Barnabas, so two of them are there. But thereafter, we see that Paul always ministers as a team, a church planting team, an apostolic team, when uh, he goes out. So uh, we, we don't rule out the fact that God may use you as an individual, 
but it's always good if you can have a team of two or more people to be involved in this work right so the church planting team now this could be you and your spouse uh, or it could be you and your spouse and some other people or it could just be two of you as friends who, who have known each other who you know the team can be any kind of composition meaning it you know different different and so over the years you know uh, the kind of teams I've worked in uh, have been very different so when um, when I was in school and college it was me just initiating the work and then other people came alongside and we we were all just students and we worked together and we started different things uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the area of the college campuses that we were. Uh, later on, uh, after I got married, Amy and I, uh, along with another couple, we pioneered together a bilingual church in New Jersey, an English-Spanish church. So in that case, there were two married couples working together as the church planting team. And then other people came alongside us to help us in that work. Now, when we moved back to India to start All People's Church, it was just Amy and me. We came, and when we, when we started from the very first day, another couple came, and uh, they were, you know, the, the, the Georgie, who was uh, he was a school friend of mine, uh, and we used to do ministry in school days together. But now, of course, both of us were married, so. Uh, Amy and I, and then Georgie and his wife, Joyce. So from the very first service we launched, they came. And so we were there, two couples, and initially we started you know, the work that way. So, uh, you know, God would orchestrate this whole thing um, and how you, you know, what kind of core team you have. But it's important, I would say, it's important to have a team, you know, just so that it's not you alone as far as possible. But uh, you and your spouse, or maybe three of you, or four of you, make that team. Now, some of the things to keep in mind when you know uh, about the team is the the members of the team are very important. It's you know the people in the team should have a healthy relationship with each other. There should be trust, support. You know, there's not competition. You know, so if you have three or four people who are trying to be better and than each other, competing with each other, that's not a good team. Uh, you should also be united theologically and spiritually, one heart, one mind. This is also very important because uh, otherwise, uh, later on, there will be those kinds of problems that you know, what you teach and preach and so on. Uh, another thing to look for in the team is, uh, can you complement each other's gifts and skills? You know, somebody can minister the word, somebody is good in leading worship, somebody is good in prayer or you know other areas evangelism administration so if you have complementing gifts and skills that is very useful right uh, another important part of uh, of the team is um, that you need everybody to be committed to this vision of the church plan yeah so nobody's coming along just because you know uh, they're just occupying a spot or they're not really committed to the vision, then that's 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 pointless. So your team must have people who are really committed to the vision of planting the church or pioneering that work in that, that place. Right. And it's important that you have a leader for the team and everybody supports that particular leader in the church planning team. That means because the leader is is overall responsible he is the vision bearer others are part of the vision but there has to be a clearly identified person who's going to lead otherwise everybody will pull the work in different directions and there will be chaos so it's very important that the church planning team have a clearly has a clearly defined identified leader so getting your core team together is very very important before you get started right or like I said, in some cases, you may start the work yourself alone, but sooner or later you need a core team. You need a few people that you will that you can identify who will become part of this team, so that together 
you're going to get the work done, right? It's uh, you don't try to continue on this work too uh, alone for too long a period of time. So the church planting core team is important, and God will bring the right people. And you know, you need to. Here are some things you think about. You know, in terms of having a really good core team. Now, in our own experience, uh, what we do here at All People's Church, you know, so initially, like I said, when we started one location, uh, then we started other locations and so on, uh, over time, what happened was uh, within the church, people were being nurtured, uh, people are being trained, and uh, they are learning how things are happening within the church. And so when we wanted to plant out new locations, and I'm especially thinking about our fourth and fifth location in Bangalore City, it was very easy for us. You know, I remember actually when, you know, uh, at this time, I think we, this was somewhere in, uh, I think it was 2012. Um, and by that time we had three, locations in Bangalore in our city and um, yeah and I, I, I may have got the year actually wrong I'm not very sure but somewhere around that time 2012 I remember once uh, one day uh, one of our young men he had met with an accident and so he uh, was in the hospital so I, I went to visit him in the hospital and when I went there, there were already some of our other young men there. You know, they were they were there just to be with him and so on. And so uh, uh, while I was there, and we were in the hospital room, they were all surrounded, and he was uh, one of our young men who had met an accident, so he was there. And we were just talking, and at that moment, in the hospital room, it was like God just, you know, <clears throat> asked me a question. What are you doing with all these young people? Young man, what are you doing with all these young people? You know, so I'm there, I've gone to visit somebody, we're in the hospital, there are about, you know, six, seven young men around, and and the Lord is, you know, speaking like speaking to me, you know, what, what are you doing with all these young people? And the next thought that comes to me is, with these people, you plant a new church. So right there in the hospital room, I asked them all, I said, hey guys, you know, it's a very strange location. It's a strange place to say, talk about church planting, but this is what actually happened. In that hospital room, with all these young men around, I said, hey guys, would all of you be ready to go and plant a church in Bangalore East, that is, you know, Whitefield, the name of the area, would you be ready to go and start a church, a branch church there? And right there in the hospital room, they all said yes. Right, so that was the core team of people. Then I said, okay. I, and uh, one of our young men was not there. I said, you know, I'm going to ask him to lead this work and we'll get the team together and we will launch. So after that meeting, I spoke to the other person. I said, hey, you know, people are ready. Would you be willing to lead the team? And we'll go and start this new location, church in this new location. And, you know, within, I think within a month or two, we actually launched our fourth location in Bangalore. And the core team was these young men. Now, it was easy for us because they satisfied all these criteria. You know, they were already in good relationship with each other. Uh, theologically, spiritually, they were all flowing together. We were all part of the same church. Uh, they had different skills that complemented each other. And they were committed to the vision of the church plan. They said, yeah, we'll do it, you know, we'll go. And they already knew what all needed to be done. And then we were able to just quickly launch. We started the church. And, you know, that's how the fourth location and in the same way we in a similar way we launched our fifth location just spoke to a few people 
are you ready to go and start here? They all said yes. The team was put together. They went and started. So from the main location, we got a team to go and start fourth location, fifth location, and it is very easy. But the point I wanted to make uh, is, you know, uh, the this core team, you know, these things are very important. The relationship, the being of the same mind theologically, and complementing each other's gifts and com being committed to the vision and having a leader. If you can get that together, you can have a core team that can go and get the work done, right? So this core team is, is important. Let me pause here to see if there are any questions on this before we move forward. Uh, are you all with me so far? Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. So that's the first thing. Try to get, you know, getting a core team together uh, is, is important. Let's go. Next, you start preparing for uh, the church plant, right? Now, uh, again, you know, you, you have to tailor this to your own journey, but I'm just giving you these ideas. So today, uh, a, a lot of preparation can happen remotely, right? Because we are able to gather information online. We could survey an entire city online. You can gather information about um, the demographics and what's going on in the city just online. So you could actually do a lot of preparation from a distance. But 20 years ago, uh, it wasn't so easy, right? So I, when we were getting ready to come and start All People's Church in Bangalore 20 years ago, now we couldn't do an online survey or you know, 22 years ago, we couldn't do an online survey and all that stuff. So we, I actually wrote letters to some pastors asking them for information, asking them for some suggestions on you know, where to start the church and so on and so forth. But today things are very different. You can go online, you can look at Google Maps, you can survey a city, you can read up a lot of information online. You can really understand the city from a distance. You can study its natural and spiritual dynamics from a distance. So part of the preparation is trying to understand uh, the people, what is happening, uh, the natural and spiritual dynamics that we spoke about. You know, study it, take some time to examine it. Or you may be already living in that same city uh, that makes it a little easier. Uh, or you may be in a different place and you're planning to go to a certain city to start the work, but you can really, uh, you should take some time to do some preparation, right? So you pray about, you think through on the natural and spiritual strategies, write down, you know, what you're understanding, what write down the thoughts that the Holy Spirit is giving you, uh, discuss with your team, the people on the team are also praying, they will come and discuss and say, hey, you know, this is what's happening and so on. Uh, and, and so you can share those thoughts with each other. Uh, listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking. He may give you some ideas, strategies as you are preparing from a distance. We may preparing for it. Another thing that can be done, if possible, is uh, develop a contact list. That means you may already have some people that you know in the city, uh, your friends who've moved into the city. So you reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I'm planning to come to this place and I'm planning to start a church in this area. But you, you know, you share the vision with them. They may be able to help in some way, right? Uh, they may be able to give you information on what's happening in the city. Uh, they may suggest places where uh, a church plant is needed. Uh, they may connect you with other pastors in the city. Uh, they may be able to provide support in terms of just the practical things that need to be done. But also keep in mind that if they are part of a church in a city, uh, don't ask them to leave. You know, don't tell them leave your church and come and join me. That's not a nice thing to do. So don't do that. But uh, but just by you know, they can give you some information. They can give you some direction. That's that's perfectly fine. But don't tell, tell them to leave their church. Okay, uh, unless God directs them to do it. That's different. But don't ask them to do it. So. As part of your preparation, you know, you get to know, okay, get to prepare yourself, understand the city. If there are people that you can reach out to, do so. Uh, get to know the pastors in the city, get to know people who are already working in the city, uh, build relationships with them, let them know you're coming and what your intent is and so on, 
right? So now over here, and, and, and we will be talking about this again a little later on, you know, it is very likely that in any city that you're planning to go start a church or a ministry, there, there is already some Christian work happening. There may be other churches, there may be other Christian ministries already in that region or in that city. How we enter and how we relate to these churches and pastors is very, very important, right? Do it very humbly and do it in a way that doesn't make them feel threatened that another church is coming and starting. Now, this just is, very, you know, the, the, the situations and the scenarios can vary. Usually, in my case, when, when, you know, when some young person comes and tells me, hey, I want to start a church in a city in Bangalore City, uh, you know, uh, for me, it's like, hey, that's amazing. Let's go do it. I'm here to help you in you know, whatever way I can. Uh, let me know. And I will help you and, you know, help you start. And, and, and some of these young people in Bangalore City, they come and they talk to, you know, they, they spend time with me learning just to how should they start their church, how should they go. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, so that's my approach. It's like I help, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm not in any way threatened by it or uh, intimidated by it. I just do the best I can to support them, help them, encourage them. Um, but that may not happen in every city. Like, you know, maybe if you go to, to a city somewhere, maybe there are people who may not like it, like the fact that you are coming to start a church or you're coming to plant a church or start a Christian ministry. They may not like that idea, you know. And so they, yeah, I'm talking about other pastors and other leaders. Uh, they may try to interfere. They may try to discredit, uh, whatever. But from our side or from your side as you are going to plant a work the best do the best you can to maintain good relationships with pastors uh, with leaders of christian ministries that are already operating in the city so the one thing i always suggest is go ahead before you start your work uh, at least the ones who are in the near and nearby to where you're going to start the work let them know that you're coming uh, let them know that you know you don't in any way uh, 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 are going to interfere in their work, uh, especially you know uh, people of the same uh, kind. That means if you are planning a spiritual church, and there are other spiritual churches in that area, you know try to establish good relationships with them, uh, with the pastors, and uh, you know make it very clear you're you're here to complement what's already happening. You're not here to compete or distract from their work, right? So maintaining good relations. We'll talk more about that uh, a little later. So once you've done your preparation, when you can prepare from a distance, of course, the next thing next thing is to go on site. So uh, at the right time, make the move. Uh, you go into that city. You go into that region, wherever God wants you to um, uh, get your work started. But before you make the move, it's important that you plan on when and how you would go about this, right? Uh, you go through a survey phase when you're on site. Uh, you you prepare. You uh, we'll talk about this each of these phases. You launch and then you go beyond that. Now, I'm giving you all of these thoughts and ideas you know this is not a rule book right this is not the ten commandments of church planting it's not that it's just ideas uh this is how you can work with god the most important thing is to follow god you know uh, god may do something differently and that's perfectly fine god may lead you differently that's perfectly fine but try to make use of these things because these are common approaches that generally many people have used in planting a church or starting a ministry but remember this these are not the ten commandments I mean this is not the only way God works right now these are just ideas or suggestions or approaches we can take right so getting back to this so relocate uh, you go on site and uh, you go through you know the survey the preparation and the launch we'll talk about these three part of going on site is to plan for your finances how are you going to fund the work? 
So this is a big thing because uh, starting a church, starting a ministry will require money. Right? Uh, you may need to rent a hall. You may need to do some promotion work. Uh, you know, if you're going to start a church service, you need to buy equipment. You need to buy chairs. You need to so many things that that cost money. So how are you going to fund the launch of the church or the ministry? Now we have different options. One is uh, you can work for a period of time, and uh, from what you earn you can start your work, start the ministry. Now we see the Apostle Paul and his team, they did this. You know, when you, in Acts, when they went to Corinth, Acts 18, they were in Corinth and there they were making and selling tents while they were also involved in planting a church and a good strong church in Corinth was planted. When Acts was in, when Paul was in Ephesus, he spent more than three years there. That was the longest period of time he spent. And it's most likely that he worked there while he was in Ephesus because he talks about it in Acts 20. He says that he worked with his own hands and he provided for his own needs. So Paul was working for three years in Ephesus while he was also establishing that church and nurturing leaders. Same thing when he was in Thessalonica. He was he and his team were working. They were doing something, most likely, you know, building tents. And he writes about that in First Thessalonians chapter two. He says, you know, I've, I've worked with my own hands. Our team, we worked with our own hands. We were not a burden to you, uh, as they planted the church in Thessalonica. So, in so you may choose to do something like that. You may choose to work and plant. That's what the apostle Paul did. And keep this in mind that just because Paul was working and planting a church, didn't take away from his apostolic anointing and calling, right? He was still an apostle. Just that he was working and planting a church, but he was still an apostle of God. And he planted these churches and then he moved on. So you can take that same approach if, if the Lord leads you that way. And you may continue to work professionally uh, and uh, raise up other leaders, or you may at the right time transition into uh, you know, just overseeing the church and when the church is able to support you financially. There are other, so you could, you know, you basically can fund the church plant through your personal finances, or there are other ways you can raise support. If a church is sending you out, uh, then the sending church will probably help you financially until you can become self sustaining or you could uh, get uh, help from other people who want to be part of your work um, and so they may not it may not be the sending church that supports you uh, but you could get money through people who are behind the vision who may support you but the point is you need to think about this pray about this see what God wants you to do as you plan for the church plant because it does cost money. Uh, you have to pay your own bills. If you have a family, you've got to take care of your family. Uh, you've got to take care of your church planting team uh, and you've got to pay for all the other expenses that are involved in doing a church plant. So think through this and you definitely have to do whatever the Lord is leading you to do and God will give you a clear strategy. Okay? And part of this is also planning for other needs uh, you know, your family, uh, children's schooling, if you have children. So think through on all these matters and have a plan how you would address these needs. Okay. Let me pause you. Any questions so far? You all with me? You okay? All right. Let's move on. I'm assuming all of you are still following me. Um, some other things to think about in the preparation phase is get to understand the legal, administrative, and regulatory matters that are involved. So wherever you go, understand that when you start a work there, it's not just about doing the ministry. 
it is there are there is a responsibility you have towards the government right because you're not working in an empty space you're working in a city you're working in some region all of that comes under the government that's there the civil authorities so it's important to understand the legal side of things what are you allowed to do what are you not allowed to do you know so on uh, it is important to put in administrative systems in place. Like you got to have a bank account. You got to have some accounting happening uh, for the money. Otherwise, you know the whole thing could get into trouble. And you also need to have follow government regulations. They may want you to file, you know, a, a, your professional income tax for yourself, for the people who are working, so on and so forth. So be familiar with these things. Uh, get to get the right help. Uh, when you go into a city think about these things okay now we are talking about these things in the other course on church and ministry administration so all that you're learning in that course comes into a, a play right here right so as you go into a city ask the question how do i form a legal entity uh, what are the regulatory compliances that i need to adhere to uh, what are the administrative systems i must have in place to make sure everything is okay. Otherwise, you go into a place where I'm going to start a church, hallelujah, you, you start preaching, all that, okay, people come. But then, if you're violating some laws, the police can come, you know, people can come, people can take this up in a legal sense, and then unnecessary trouble begins to happen, right? So just keep this in mind that part of church planting is you got to be in compliance with the legal, administrative, regulatory requirements of that particular place where you're going to start the work. Uh, don't violate it. Otherwise, uh, all the good work that you do spiritually uh, can suddenly come to a halt uh, if any of these problems arise. Right? So try to prepare yourself with this ask the questions you can research online ask people who are in that city uh, to guide you or ask the church that is sending you to give you the guidance on these matters and they will prepare you and you should be ready okay so that's so far in terms of preparation and overview of how you prepare let me just run through it very quickly you know think about a church core team getting the work started uh, you can prepare from a distance, do some research, plan to relocate, get on site, plan for your finances, plan for other personal needs, and plan for the legal, administrative, regulatory matters that are involved. So now, part of your planning is you need to survey the city. right? So we have done your preparatory planning from a distance. You've gone online. You've, you know, you've looked on, looked on Google Maps. You've read about the city. If you've, you've got all the background information, that's wonderful. Now you're on site. You're in the city. Now you got to try to get a feel of the city. What is the city like? Right. So uh, you survey the city. Right. Take time to get a feel of the city. And there's a sample towards the end of this. Uh, this. This. Uh, this document of course it was done some years ago for our own city but something similar you know you try to understand the demographics and what's going on in the city um, if you saw the city go around the city and it's very interesting when you look at how Paul worked how the Apostle Paul worked now let's take some time to read both of these passages let's read Acts 16 11 to 15 I think it's very interesting just to See how Paul did his work. Acts 16, 11 to 15. Somebody could read it for us, please. Okay, go ahead. Shall I read past? Please go ahead. Acts chapter 16, verse 11 to 15 says, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and 
the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of the seller of purple from the city of Theatera, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Amen. Now think about this. So Paul and his team, they come to the city of Philippi. Now, it was a new city for them, right? Yeah. They're just Paul and the steam. They're just moving from city to city, proclaiming Jesus. Um, they did not have a course on urban church planting. Uh, they had none of these things which you and I have today, right? So, so then you know, somebody said, "Why? Why should we do this course? Because you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. God has given us much. He's given us all these resources. So He's expecting us to make use of these resources." In Paul's day and time, they didn't have all these, so God just worked with them in the with whatever they had. But always remember, the law of God is to whom much is given, much is expected, right? So don't take, yeah, you know, okay, Paul went just randomly went, and I also randomly go. Now God expects us to be responsible, all right? But going back to Paul's scenario, you know, Paul and his team they just come to Philippi, and notice what it says here. They they. Verse 12, end of verse 12, they were staying in that city for some days. And we don't know what some days is. Was it three days? Was it seven days? Was it 10, you know, or I don't know, right? some days. Maybe it was three days or four days. Well, how many other days leading to that particular Sabbath day, right? So they were there, and we can just assume that they must have been going around the city asking, hey, uh, is there any religious, is there any prayer meeting happening, anything going on? And they must have got some information saying, hey, on the Sabbath day, there's a prayer meeting happening by the riverside. Uh, you can go there. So on the Sabbath day, Paul and his team, they go there because they've been told. Prayer is because there's a prayer meeting happening regularly by the riverside. So they go there. That's verse 13. And they start talking to the people. Now, here it was a women's prayer meeting. It was the women who were meeting there. And there was a lady who was a, a, who was a businesswoman. Her name was Lydia. So she was a businesswoman. She was part of the prayer meeting. Now, when Paul and his team come, they start talking to these people, these, this, this women's prayer meeting. And they start telling, obviously, they're preaching the, to, the, to them about Jesus. Now, this woman's prayer meeting, they must have been Jewish, I think, and they're just, you know, talking about whatever they knew. But now they're paying attention to what Paul has to say about Jesus Christ. And notice what happens in verse 14. The Lord opened her heart. Just beautiful. That God opened somebody's heart as Paul is preaching. And then she says, hey, come to my house. You know, and, and from there on, we see how the things that happen in Philippi and demon possessed girl is set free and the jailer is affected. And you know, there's this, this the things that happen that, that establish a work in the city of Philippi. But how did it all start? Paul and his team came there and they stayed there for some days. They were just surveying. They were spending time in the city. They must have asked around. They got one contact. Go by the riverside on the Sabbath day. There's a prayer meeting. So they went there. And from there, the doors began to open. Very interesting. right? So that one contact, which they would have obtained as they surveyed the city, opened the door. God just led them that way. So here, so when we are on location in the city, 
just be open to what God is doing as you are saying, God, I want to start a church in the city. I want to plant a church. How do I do it? You know, God can give you that one contact or somebody who is going to, in that city, who's going to open the door, who's going to welcome you, and the ministry can get started that way. In chapter 17, uh, you know, Paul, Paul and his team, they continue. Um, they're on their missionary journey. They're planting churches. They're starting work in different areas. In Acts 17, they come to Athens. And very interesting, once again, to see how they went about church planting in Athens. Right. So can we, can we read there from Acts 16 uh, uh, to... Acts chapter 17, sorry, verses 16 to 23. Can somebody read that for us? Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, he stood waiting to go to the country, and he found that the city was given to the Jordan. Go ahead. Is that Asha or Kong Balu? To the unknown God, therefore the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. Okay, so thank you. Acts 17, verses 16 to 23. So Paul comes to Athens. What does he do there? Now, some of his team members of you know, he has sent Silas and Timothy, they've, he sent them away. So he's kind of alone there in Athens for some time. What does he do? He kind of goes around the city. No, so you can understand, you can just imagine Paul is surveying the city. He must be just praying around the city and saying, seeing what's going on. He sees a lot of idols in that city. He's going around the city. And then he also starts engaging with the people. He's starting to talk with the people. Hey, what do you do? He's trying to get the feel of what are these people all about? So verse 17, Acts 17, verse 17, he's, he's reasoning with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers in the marketplace. So he's in the synagogue. He's also in the marketplace where you know a lot of people are interacting, buying and selling. He's talking to people. He's listening to them. He's having conversation with them. Uh, he's asking them questions. He's letting them ask questions. And of course, in all of these conversations, he is presenting Jesus to them. So then they realize that Paul is talking about something new they haven't heard of before. And so what happens? These, the you know the, verse 18 says you know he's he's talking about Jesus and the resurrection I mean we haven't heard about this is something new so what do they do verse 19 they take him to Aeropagus Aeropagus or otherwise translated as Mars Hill was this elite group of you know of people maybe about 12 to 24 people who were like the elders of the city they were the, the highest intellectuals of Athens so Athens itself was a very intellectual place, but they had this special elite group called uh, a group of people who sat at Mars Hill. So Mars Hill was a actual location, uh, it was a hillside, but this group sat and they would, if anybody had a new idea, a new philosophy, they would come and speak to this elite group of people and they would decide you know, whether this is worth discussing worth talking about or not so paul is invited to speak to this group the aeropagus on mars hill through this group of people 
Now, so, so what an opportunity, like you're standing before the, you know, if you want to think about it today, you're standing before the governor and the chief minister of your state or, you know, the, the, the people who make decisions or some highly intellectual professors in your city or something like that. You know, so Paul comes and then he starts talking to them. But it's very interesting how Paul speaks to them. He's, he starts telling them, look, I see that you're very religious. So he's done a survey of the city, of what these people are involved in. And then he starts with that. You know, this is what I know about you. In fact, as you read his sermon, you find that he also read some of the literature. You know, and he quotes from some of their own poets. And he says, you know, one of your own poets has written this. So that means in that time that he was there in the city of Athens, he surveyed the city, he conversed with he conversed with people, he learned about their culture, he learned about even what their poets have written, and he used all that in order to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to this elite group um, that he had the opportunity to stand before. Right? And the this Act chapter 17 eventually tells us that some of the people in the Aeropagus believed. That means he, you know, he preached Jesus to them and these, some of the people, elite people believed. And it's most likely, you know, a church was established in Athens and then Paul moved on. But I, uh, the point I want to bring across from both these passages in Acts 16, Acts 17 is Paul took time to understand the city, understand the culture, uh, understand what was going on. He surveyed the city while he was on location, and then God orchestrated his path. You know, just imagine uh, in, in Athens, and I'm, and I'm just getting ready to close here. In Athens, you know, one day when somebody would have come and say, hey, Paul, uh, I, I got an appointment for you with the, with the Aerop at the Aeropagus. Uh, tomorrow they want you to come and talk to them. I mean, th that's a divine setup. God set that up for Paul, right? Because otherwise... Paul was a nobody in Athens, but for him to get an opportunity to speak to the highest elite group of intellectuals in Athens, it was amazing. But Paul was doing his work, surveying the city, having conversations, understanding the culture, and then God set up an open door and he spoke to the highest group of people in Athens. And some of them even believed what he presented. So surveying the city, understanding what's going on, that's something important to do, right? We'll stop here for today. We will pick this up tomorrow. We'll continue from here. Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? I um, hope these things are being useful to you, all right? Uh, we're just getting into some practical nitty-gritty things, what need to be done uh, when we go about planning the church. Maggie, you have some questions? Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, it's con concerning Act, act uh, 16 when Paul heard that with, there was a prayer meeting going on in, in a certain area. Mm -hmm. um, just want to know, sir, does that mean that there was a, a church planted there before Paul arrived, or it was just a custom, a Jewish, Jewish custom to do that, to go there to pray? Mm. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, from what we can understand it was more of a jewish prayer meeting like for example you know they had the synagogues where people would meet for prayer the jewish people would meet so this was an extension of that so these were the jewish women who just met by the riverside for prayer and singing and you know whatever they would do so paul was directed towards them uh, they, uh, we know that it was not a church because uh, they had not yet heard about Christ. Uh, and and it, was a, it was God who opened uh, Lydia's heart to the message of Jesus Christ. And she welcomes them in and salvation came uh, uh, and so on. So that's what we can infer from what we read there in, uh, in Acts 16. Yeah. Okay, Shrikumar. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I just, uh, I just have a doubt um, regarding to you now what you discussed on about, about Paul. 
that he used their uh, you know literature to convince the people about Jesus and you know even they used the their poems and the songs to um, you know to focus on Jesus. Now this is something which recently happened um, you know maybe a few months back. So regarding to that, uh, you know the people started uh, uh, the uh, um, quoting the scripture. And uh, that's why I just want to know that how how the things uh, how the people are using this scripture and, and I will tell you what was that that um, recently in India um, one of uh, a famous um, worship leader used the uh, the Bollywood songs to preach the gospel and later he said that the Paul did the same thing uh, when he was in that particular location and he also used their songs to preach the gospel so how how can uh, you know how can uh, is is that the right thing what he did that is my question thank you pastor mm -hmm. mm. interesting it's a good question uh, the reason i'm laughing is or i'm just see uh, we shouldn't take things overboard right so exactly what you were saying there was a time in uh, in the united states where pastors were spending so much time watching movies so in order to prepare for sunday sermon they'd be watching movies so that they can take things from the movies and uh, use it in their sunday sermon uh, in order to appeal to the congregation now this was such a silly thing but it was true it was happening you know um so they sp they spend more time watching movies talking about just generally secular movies in order to see what they can take and put it into their sermon on sunday as part of the sermon preparation that was ridiculous so that's pushing this idea too far right so what i would say is you know that there, there, there is a right way to do things you know, uh, and then there is a misapplication of truth. Uh, so the right is, okay, yeah, of course, you know, if there are things that we can, you know, you read something in the newspaper, you hear some news event, and you're using that and saying, hey, you know, look, you're using that as a point of discussion or connection, it's fine. But as people of God, you know, we have to spend time in the Word of God and in prayer. That's our preparation for ministering to people. And then, yeah, you, you do read, you do take uh, your information and, and, and use it, but it shouldn't go overboard. And secondly, uh, it should not distract either us or our audience. So in the case where you're talking about, you know, uh, using f music from, you know, the film industry, Bollywood, wherever, secular, and using that to proclaim the gospel, personally, I think it's pushing this truth too far because the Bible says the gospel is the power of God, right? That means our dependence is on the message of the gospel. That's where the power of God is. It's not in, you know, quoting, you know, or referencing or secular music or that's not the power of god that's not where the power of god is the power of god is in the message of the gospel now if somebody wants to use one point of reference for people or a point of connection it's okay but we shouldn't go overboard with it our dependence is not on the secular music our dependence is on the message of the gospel or it's not on the news the news can be used as a point of reference so example if you listen to some of billy graham's sermons it's quite amazing uh, in many of his sermons, in his big crusades, he would reference uh, one or two current events that are happening. So the audience knows that, okay, he's talking about this event or this event, but it's only that that's not the main message. The main message is the message of Jesus Christ. But he uses those points of reference to address problems in the people, saying, look, this is happening, so there is a problem. This is happening, there's a problem. But the answer to the problem is Jesus Christ, and then he preaches the gospel. 
So it's a very nice way of, you know, of the way he presents the message. But the focus is not on the current event or uh, the connection he's drawing. The focus is on the message of the gospel. And even in Paul's preaching, Acts 17, he does reference, you know, he takes a quote from one of those poems, but the focus comes back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I think, um, to answer your question, it's okay to reference cultural points or uh, current events and other things, but that itself shouldn't be the focus. We should come back to the gospel, because that's the gospel is the power of God. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you. Taesha, please go ahead. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, everyone. You said um, preachers before, they were using movies to preach the gospel. Um, but were people being saved through this method? Um, that's a good question, too. <laughs> uh, you know, they were able to entertain their audiences. Uh, they were, were able to maybe keep the attention of the audiences for you know that 25 minutes, 30 minutes, but that that whole thing eventually died out. Yeah, um, it was actually part of what was called as creative church movement. Uh, this this was kind of on the forefront, let's say, and the early, the first decade of the 2000. Uh, it was called the creative church. And so part of that, people were doing all these things, uh, but it has died out because it didn't really produce the kind of results. You know, the, the life transformation was not happening because, like, it's the gospel that changes lives, not these <laughs> stories from movies and so on. You know, yeah, good question. Okay, Pastor, thank you. Okay, uh, let's wrap up. If there are no more questions, can we ask somebody to pray? And we'll dismiss and we'll meet again tomorrow. Somebody can pray and dismiss us, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this study this morning we thank you so much for the knowledge of god and for us to know your truth and the truth shall set us free mm. and we thank you so much that we know your power and nothing else can do your work nothing else even from the secular world can do or replace your holy spirit mm. and the work that you have done in the ages and through the ages and will continue to do because you are the supreme ruler of the universe. You are the most high God and we thank you that your gospel will not be diluted. Mm. Lord God, even if we wanted to, cannot be. You will rise up your people, empower them and send them out light in the olden days. So we thank you, Lord God. We thank you so much for this study and we thank you so much for your church that need planting, Lord God. He said the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. Mm -hmm. So Father, rise up the laborers as you keep us to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for Pastor Ashish and the every team that organized this course. We thank you so much. And we give you thanks for their health and strength and continued protection mm -hmm. from each of schoolmates, Father, as the in their own respective countries, cities, states, Father, wherever they are all over the nations, you are imparting them with knowledge to impact their communities and the world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. I'll see you again tomorrow. God bless you. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor.